So there are some overlaps between this session and the previous one on emerging um, units, but we hope that this will be a kind of practical guide to establishing some behavioral insight principles in practice in, in government um, at various different uh, levels. Um, this is partly as a result of the fact that there are now, as you all know, many, many uh, nudge units, behavioral insight teams, behavioral insight units around the world. Um, I compiled this, uh, this chart of, of many of them. It's not comprehensive. Um, so if you feel that you yourself are in a unit that is not on this uh, list, come and see me afterwards and I'll, I'll add you on. Um, uh, we're going to go through three different case studies uh, today. I'm going to talk about the United Kingdom. Um, I'm the managing director of the Behavioral Insights team. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the sort of story that we went through, through a framework that I'll introduce in a, in a couple of minutes' time. Um, as you probably know, at the Behavioral Insights team, we love our frameworks. Um, but you'll be pleased to know it's not a mnemonic, so uh, don't worry about that. Um, I'm then going to introduce Ping Soon. He's going to talk about uh, Singapore, who have taken uh, Behavioral Insights to a very advanced level um, across the Singaporean uh, government. So Ping Soon is going to give us a couple of examples of some of the practical applications of behavioral insights in Singapore. And then I'm going to hand over to Elspeth Kirkman, who is the head of uh, the behavioral insights team's North American office. And Elspeth works across uh, US cities with a big program of work with Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies. Um, so you should be able to get lots of different insights from different layers of government. Um, but all of them uh, have gone through, we think, the same similar trajectory that we think that we can all learn from. And in some ways, it was the path that when we were creating the Behavioral Insights team back in 2010, we started to think about putting it into practice without really knowing whether or not it might work. Um, and so there are, there are four parts to this very, very simple framework. Um, the first is, is all about getting buy-in from your partners. And I'm going to talk a bit about what we mean by partners and how it's not just about political uh, support that's important there. Um, the second, which is a theme that I think has come through many, many different sessions um, over the past couple of days, which is starting with the quick wins and why this is really, really important um, to being able to then move to more complex uh, policy areas. And we think that sometimes this is almost the most important lesson that is often uh, uh, forgotten about because behavioral insights has always been quite a new discipline. Um, and if you're able to be able to say, here is something that we can demonstrably say works, then you can start moving on to more complex areas. And then the fourth and final thing is the importance of building your capability. So building the capability of both your team but also being quite open to working with others, to building partnerships and to helping others to develop their own uh, capability. So that trajectory is the one that I'm going to talk through from a UK case study perspective. Ping Soon is going to do um, uh, something similar in relation to Singapore, and then Elspeth is going to do uh, something very similar in relation to, to US cities. So case study number one, the United Kingdom. Um, so the, the, this first lesson is it is almost impossible to get a team up and running if you don't have backing from the people that you need in order to get programs and projects uh, in place. And I think in the UK context, there are some individuals that we all almost always like focus upon as part of this uh, uh, process. Um, so the Prime Minister was obviously critical in helping to lay the foundations for the creation of the Behavioural Insights team back in 2010. Um, but just as important, were uh, what we describe as the administrative uh, support that is often uh, not recognized. So these two people here, this is um, on the, in the middle there is, is Lord Gus O'Donnell, who used to be the head of the UK civil service. He's now, um, uh, he's now no longer a civil servant, but he continues as the chair of our academic advisory panel. And on the right hand side is Sir Jeremy Hayward, who is the new head of the UK civil service. Both of those people, in addition to the prime minister, were very, very strong supporters of behavioral insight approaches as alternatives to a more regulatory driven uh, approach to get, getting stuff to happen in a UK government uh, context. And they're kind of often forgotten about in the context of uh, creating and sustaining a, a unit. But um, my real uh, behavioral insight hero are not any of these uh, three characters. They are people like uh, this guy. This is Nick Down who is, he was the head of a unit in HMRC um, called Debt Management and Banking. And this person, I'm sure none of you have ever heard of. 
uh, but he is um, in, in many ways critical in the life cycle of the behavioral insight team. And it's, it's partly as a result of the fact that if you really want to make something happen within a behavioral insight context, you need to find people who are operational leaders whose aim is to make things happen. Um, and you can have all of the political support that you want, but without individuals on the ground who are willing to take things down a different path, it is very difficult to make anything happen. And my, my one bit of advice would be to say, find your Nick Downs wherever you are, whatever administration you're working in, because they're the people who will be able to uh, uh, create um, the next stage of things, which is uh, the quick wins. Um, and that I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe in a minute what I mean by the kind of characteristics of these quick wins. Um, but in what is now probably the most famous example of the behavioral insights team's work, which has been around tax compliance, um, it was really uh, Nick Down in the tax administration, the tax authority in the UK, who spotted this initial opportunity. He'd read Robert Cialdini's work around uh, social influence and was interested in how it could be applied in a UK government um, context. We spied that opportunity and we seconded uh, people from our unit into the tax authority in order to work with Nick to start running these trials. And as you probably know, it's almost, almost like I feel that this one example is, 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 is now uh, so often quoted, it's become a cliche that nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time. Um, but uh, if it wasn't for individuals like Nick, we would have never run these uh, experiments. Um, similarly, we had uh, developed some partnerships with uh, people in the court service in the UK. Uh, and it kind of exemplified another aspect of our early approach, which is unless you really understand the operational side of practice, you won't be able to see where the opportunities are for putting in, in practice uh, projects uh, and running trials. And in this particular case, we noticed that there was a, there was a guy in the court service who was texting people who'd failed to pay their fines. And at the same time, when we went out with bailiffs, we noticed that people just weren't opening final reminder letters. So there was an opportunity to work within the operational side of the court service to, to run uh, trials. And again, uh, this is a sort of fairly famous uh, early example of ours. We noticed that texting people, prompting them to pay their court fines on time, uh, more than doubled uh, the response rates and personal messages that were aimed at an individual uh, seemed to be even more uh, effective. And similarly, I could tell this story about maybe 50 different areas. Uh, we work with the Department for Energy and Climate Change at the moment at which they were changing the labeling for uh, energy performance certificates, which every house that's being sold in the UK needs to uh, display. Uh, these are the old uh, certificates, very similar to the car labeling example that's been used a few times. Uh, here, almost impossible for anybody to understand. I remember when we were doing this work now, you know, four or five years ago, um, asking that question, could anybody actually explain these labels to me in, in sort of lay person terms? And the answer seemed to be an emphatic uh, no. They tell you that you can go from a 37 to a 73 on the energy efficiency rating front, but if you look at the environmental impact in terms of carbon dioxide, you could go from a 31 to a 69. So we changed it to, to this, which just tells you how much it will cost to heat and light your home over a three-year period and how much you could save if you take three simple uh, actions. Um, so what, what, what are the kind of features of a, of a quick win? Well, we think that, um, and just going back to my earlier point, that the purpose of the quick win is be, to be able to demonstrate in the early days of creating a unit that you can put something into practice relatively simply, that you can demonstrate an effect, and that that will then take you on to more complex areas. And there are a few lessons, right? So you're already doing something. You're already sending out letters. You're already... Um, trying to collect your, your fines. The second is that you're already measuring the outcomes. You don't need to put in place lots of new complex uh, outcome measures that you have to then create new monitoring systems to, uh, to see whether or not they're likely to be uh, effective. The third is that you can vary the interventions in some ways. If you're sending out 200,000 tax letters, um, the real question is can you vary the way in which you do so um, by changing some of the letters and not changing the others? Um, and then ideally, you've also got a large sample of people as well. You know, are you talking about a system in which you're sending out 10 letters to 10 uh, people across the country, or are you talking about a system where 200, 300,000 people um, are involved? And then the last lesson is that you get the results back reasonably quickly. 
right? So for it to be a quick win, it's no good to be in a situation where you're saying, we'll put this in, in place, and in three years' time, we will get the results. Um, but what these quick wins enables you, you to do is, is to build the case for those areas that are more complex and will take a lot more time. And it was only after 18 months or so that we started to move into some of these more uh, complex areas. So this is um, uh, a job center um, in Essex um, in a place called uh, Lousen. In fact, Elspeth herself did a lot of, uh, lot of trips to this particular uh, job center. Um, uh, we were asked to work on this program, which was around helping to get people back into work more quickly. It would have been, I think, for the behavioral insights team in its early days, fairly suicidal to start with this project because you're talking about very, very complex interventions that will take many, many months, if not years, to reveal their results. But once you have a tranche of interesting findings, people will start to come to you and say, actually, I've got this problem that is quite complicated that you will need to invest more time and effort into putting into practice. So we spent time working in uh, this particular job center in order to design interventions, and a lot of them were um, uh, exemplifiers of the kind of approach that we had then, by this point, um, started to detail. So it was all around simplification of processes, getting people to commit to future activities rather than dwelling upon uh, what happened um, in the past. Um, so we'd now run um, we, we turn this into a big trial to demonstrate the effectiveness of this, uh, these kinds of interventions in a job searching context. And in fact, uh, a lot of this work has also been demonstrated to be quite effective in Australia um, and Singapore. And there are lots of trials, including those that David uh, talked about uh, this morning, that show that once you've got some of your quick wins, you can start trialing things in much more complex uh, environments. The other thing is that it started to create those quick wins demand in lots of interesting new areas that wouldn't necessarily be seen initially as sort of classic behavioral insight type interventions. So this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, we work with the Home Office and the Metropolitan Police, the police force for uh, London, who are worried about the rates of mobile phone theft. Um, 750,000 mobile phones get stolen every year in the UK. Um, and um, we realized that it was going to be quite difficult to influence consumer behavior in this area. So we developed, um, borrowing from some work that had been done in the 1980s around car thefts, uh, what we call this mobile phone theft ratio, which is using the data that the Metropolitan Police uh, gather to construct these charts that show you which mobile phones in London are the most targeted. And we do that by looking at which phones are stolen in context in which they could have been known to be a particular brand of phone as opposed to situations where somebody's had their bag snatched and you wouldn't have known what kind of make of mobile phone was in it. And for the first time uh, this year, we're finding that Apple phones do not dominate the top of the list. So the most uh, targeted phone in London at the moment is the HTC M8. And the point of this is that the manufacturers hold the key to reducing mobile phone thefts. Um, uh, and we can see in the data the effect of new security measures on mobile phone uh, handsets uh, when they come in and what the effect is on theft uh, rates. Um, and it allows you as well to start thinking about much bigger, more strategic policy questions. Again, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. David um, uh, talked about this a lot this morning. But it enables you to publish reports like this. Uh, this is one that we published a couple of weeks ago. I think it's really, really fascinating um, and could lead to a whole new program of work for us in the future. It's around a kind of new vision for how you might regulate consumer markets in the future if you applied an explicitly behavioral uh, lens. Um, so it will encourage you all to, uh, to, to read that. But the point of this is to just say, having those quick wins in the early days gives you license to move on to these bigger uh, more strategic, more complex areas. But none of that is possible if you don't think about how you build capability. Um, and so I think one of the things that um, certainly I have spent a lot of the past four or five years thinking about is uh, things like um, what kind of team do you want to uh, recruit and put in place? Um, so one lesson that I think has come through many of the sessions that I've seen over the past couple of days has been that you need to have a good blend of people from different specialisms. So it's not just about 
getting a first-rate academic behavioral scientist and putting them into a government department. It's about thinking at the team level rather than the individual. And the three sets of skills that we always try to blend within a project team are people who've got policy skills. So people who understand the systems of the governments and the processes that they are looking at. People who have very, very advanced behavioral science knowledge and skills who can spot the opportunity. Um, who can then work with the person who understands the system in order to put something in place. And then people who have trial design experience as well. And there is the possibility, obviously, that someone has all of those skills. But I think we have found very, very few people who can combine all three of those things in, in one person. So thinking at the team level uh, is the first thing. The second is methods are really important. Um, and from an early stage, we started to put quite a lot of emphasis upon our methodologies. Um, so we uh, developed a series of project management uh, tools that exemplify how we think you should run a behavioral insights type project. Um, and that links to uh, what we would call thought leadership. So interestingly, this paper that we wrote three or four years ago, Test, Learn, Adapt, um, uh, we were amazed to find it was the most downloaded policy paper um, for the cabinet office that, that year. Who'd have thought that a paper on running randomized evaluations might become uh, popular for the uh, policymaking community um, and frameworks around how to develop uh, solutions. Um, but the, I think number one important thing for us is around um, that strong focus on, on training and helping others. And that partly explains um, why the UK government has not seen the development of the behavioral insights team as something which uh, somehow usurps what they might be doing themselves. But alongside the growth of BIT has been the growth of units within pretty much every government department. And I think similar things are starting to happen in, in Singapore and in, um, in, in Australia and elsewhere as well. Um, so I'm going I'm to just finish by telling you a little bit about what's happening across the rest of the UK government, because um, it is in some ways like many uh, quite quite interesting to see how the UK government has expanded its uh, its interest in this in this area. So there are lots of units, dedicated units that now have uh, reasonable headcounts um, in areas like uh, tax compliance. HMRC said to me they weren't sure whether they had 35 people or 13 people who were behavioral insight specialists. It depends uh, on your definition. Uh, our Department for Work and Pensions, um, the Financial Conduct Authority, the Ministry of Justice, they all have dedicated units, and some of them are reasonably uh, large. But just as uh, prevalent is a model which is a small capacity of one, two, three people who are managing networks across their, their departments. Um, so again, I was quite surprised that our National Audit Office, which is like the kind of uh, policeman for government has a couple of full-time equivalent people, but a, a practitioner group of 60 across the, uh, uh, the whole of the NAO. Um, and similarly, we have uh, several departments who don't have dedicated capacity or, or units, um, but they are now running um, fairly major uh, programs and projects uh, of their own. So it might be the Foreign Office work on countering uh, corruption. Uh, we've got an event uh, tomorrow uh, on that, or the Treasury's new interest in things like long-termism and, uh, and pensions. Um, but I go back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is that I think without that focus on um, building capacity, on, on gaining the support of others, and then in the early days getting some quick wins under your belt, I don't think any of this would have, would have happened in a uh, UK context. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand over to uh, Ping Soon, who's from the Ministry of Manpower. And I think it would be fair to say that the Ministry of Manpower has done uh, more than any other government department in Singapore to help embed behavioral insights. Um, and Ping Soon is a very important man. He is a, um, he's, also a very, he's also a very modest man. Um, he's the uh, uh, Deputy Secretary, a Deputy Secretary in the Ministry of Manpower. Um, he oversees their corporate services uh, group, but more importantly for uh, us all, um, that includes uh, their behavioral design unit. So I'll hand over to Ping Soon, then to Elspeth, and then we'll do a bit of a discussion and Q&A. Thank you, Owen. Um, I'm delighted to join Owen and Elspeth on this panel to share some of the Singapore experience of our government agencies in behavior insights. Actually, our relationship with BIT goes back to 2012, 
And uh, in fact, we have recently renewed our third MOU with them, which will see us doing projects within the Ministry of Manpower, which is where I'm from, to national level projects with other government agencies. Now, having said that, uh, I need that clicker, right? Yeah. Having said that, actually, the applications of behavioural insights and behavioural economics are actually not very new in Singapore. Um, as some of you all know, Singapore is a pretty small country. Just how small? About 700 square kilometres. That book is slightly smaller than New York City. Well, about 100 kilometres square smaller than New York City. And with about a million vehicles. So managing traffic in Singapore is a big issue. So, in the 1970s, the policymakers wanted to see how they could reduce congestion in downtown. So we implemented the area licensing scheme. Uh, this is a, a scheme you know, where motorists will have to pay for a single charge, either on a monthly or daily rate basis, for the right to drive into the downtown. So you will definitely recognize this, right? It's a classic case of a sunk cost policy, right? So since you have already paid for it, why constrain the use of your car? So the policymakers then wanted to find out whether there's another better method, you know, to increase the salience of the cost of driving to congest congested area. So uh, in 1998, which is almost 20 years ago, the government introduces the Electronic Road Pricing System, or ERP for short. The ERP charges the motorists on a pay-as-you-use basis as it crosses every gantry. So how it does is that you have a store value card in a, in a vehicle, which will then uh, be deducted every time you cross over a gantry. And so in uh, 2008, this was further improved. What happened is that we have uh, allowed the motorists to see the real-time charges that you, can, uh, that you have to pay uh, in using a congested road. So that makes the, the, the actual cost the, the saliency of the cost uh, in terms of uh, driving a congested road even more salient for motorists. So today, ERP is actually quite synonymous for driving in Singapore. And for the locals, uh, the ERP doesn't stand for electronic road pricing. It stands for everyday road people. <laughs> uh, and, and that beep sound that you hear when the vehicle crosses the gantry is one of the most painful sounds that any Singaporean would want to hear. Uh, of course, you will know that this picture is a hoax, right? There's no road in Singapore with so many ERP gantries <laughs> on a short street. Maybe two, but not five or six, right? So uh, the point here is that I, I think if, if we had been applying behavioural insights you know, in our policy design 20 years ago, so what's, what's really new here, right? I think the behavioural insights has uh, certainly kicked up a fervour in Singapore over the last two years. Partly it's due to the great work you know, done by many of the renowned behavioural scientists over here, but partly it's also because of the sea change in terms of the policy-making environment in Singapore. In, uh, 20, in, uh, in uh, 2015, a study of our citizen satisfaction with the government shows that over a third of our respondents are dissatisfied with the way they interacted with the government, which is uh, pretty startling for us. Citizens expect public services you know, to be done in a way that is easy to use. Citizens expect services to be done that, uh, or to be delivered in a way that's more empathetic and more personalised. And certainly, citizens demand that the services are being delivered in a very consistent and timely manner. Unfortunately, some of our programmes did not meet the mark. Many of our communication materials are laden with official jargon and uh, legalistic language. You know. Our policies sometimes are crafted for that average Joe that only exists in the realm of the policy makers. And some of our services are being designed to almost guarantee that you need to have a human interaction. So, set against these challenges, uh, the application of BI in Singapore are focused on three broad areas. Number one, how do we improve service delivery? How can we increase the customer's or citizen's satisfaction in dealing with the government and at the same time encourage them to do self-help? And two, how do we increase the compliance and improve enforcement productivity? Essentially, how do we nudge our citizens to be a bit more law-abiding and, and for us to have less enforcement resources to do that? And third, how can we improve our program design? Specifically, how can we help people reach better life outcomes? Now, our agencies also did not start with a big bank. Uh, they begin with relatively simple BI projects, uh, as what uh, Owen said, you know, the quick wins. Uh, and that's important, of course, to generate confidence as well as to win friends. Uh, I'm going to give you three quick examples. The first is a project between the Behavioural Design Unit in the Ministry of Manpower, where I'm from, and the Central Provident Fund Board, or CPF. Just a quick plug, the CPF is actually our mandatory social security savings schemes, jointly funded uh, in terms of contributions by the employers and employees. It is a key pillar in our social security system that serves to meet the Singaporeans' retirement needs, housing needs and healthcare needs, among others. Now, we all know that when it comes to uh, retirement planning, people generally do two things, three things, right? Number one, they generally discount the future, they underestimate their needs and they fail to plan sufficiently ahead. 
So, the CPF board recently introduced a pre-retirement planning service for those turning 55. This is a one-to-one, 45-minute -one, service with this young pretty officer uh, who will explain and guide you through the uh, retirement options. And because it's a pilot, the CPF board sent out uh, a letter like this to 1,000 Singaporeans to invite them to attend the service. Make a guess how many turn up for this, right? 150, even though it's free. So what do we do? So the BDU worked with uh, the, C the CPF board to simplify the letter, uh, to increase the relevance by providing personalised information, and shifted the focus to pre-commit the recipients, to have them think about when should I go rather than should I go. We conducted a four-arm RCT that tested the effectiveness of the various interventions, and the letter that pre-commits the participants uh, was most effective, with about 32% uh, taking up the service. The second example uh, that I want to quote is one from the Ministry of Home Affairs. Now, their problem is how can I get Singaporeans to be more prepared for emergency by attending free emergency preparedness training conducted by the fire service? So they have all these uh, services, uh, uh, training, so what do they do, right? Typically, they will print leaflets indicating the schedule of the training and distribute it to the neighbourhoods. As you can imagine, not many people turn up for that. So the fire service decided to reframe their invites you know, by highlighting the salience of the training. So the redesigned invites will focus you know, on telling them you know, what are the things that you can learn by attending the training that will help yourself to protect yourself, to protect your family, and to protect your neighbours. And just a simple change like that, uh, over 70% of the respondents who received this invite expressed interest to attend the training, uh, compared to about 43% from the control group. But what's more important is that 14% of those who expressed interest uh, who are being nudged to pre-commit the, the, to attend the training actually turn up compared to 1% of those who are not being nudged who just uh, given the schedule of training. So it's quite impressive for, for the fire service. My third example is uh, one of the things that the Singaporeans uh, 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 hate to get, you know, which is a parking ticket. And uh, when Singaporeans receive a parking ticket, the most instinctive reaction they do is not to pay, it's to appeal. You know, they appeal to the authorities to waive the parking ticket. So our problem is how do we actually uh, discourage the unnecessary appeals against all these parking fines? Because many times the appeals are baseless, are groundsless, but it takes up a lot of our processing resources. So the Urban Redevelopment Authority, uh, which actually manages the public car parks in Singapore, redesigned their online appeal service. Uh, the interface now provides salient information that most appeals were rejected and uh, that most people paid their fines on time. And the option to proceed with payment was also provided with the same online service. This is an online service for you to appeal, but uh, we also tell them, look, you know, instead of appealing, you can just go ahead and click the button and pay for the fine. <laughs> Simple interventions, right? And uh, it actually reduced appeals by about 35%. I'm sorry, about, about 12% or about 3,500 per year. So those three were the easy wins. Um, and uh, the interventions, as you can see, is relatively simple. A change in the letter, a change in the invite, a change in the website. But it was important in you know, order to create confidence and uh, win new friends. Uh, so with this, I think the uh, uh, confidence of the team uh, increases. Uh, management support was there. And so we went on to do bigger projects. And I'm going to share three examples. First, how do we help disadvantaged households who have been receiving financial aid gain independence through work? We know from our survey that 25% or a quarter of these households actually have a work-capable person in the household, so they could actually get work. But a lot of times, these families are being caught in what I call a state of learned helplessness and sometimes lack the motivation to be weaned off uh, financial assistance. So the Ministry of Social and Family Development partnered the Public Service Division, uh, actually designing and running a series of work trials uh, along with a jobs workbook that support their job search process. This workbook is designed to ignite their intrinsic motivation to gain financial independence. But more importantly, the whole job search journey through this workbook is broken down into bite-sized tasks that then nudge, the, nudge them into action. And then this is further complemented by a series of uh, automated text messages that are being sent to them regularly to commit them to the actions. The trials are currently underway, and uh, we hope to have positive results to share in uh, BX 2017. Second, how can we get our residents to lead healthier lives? Now, based on WHO guidelines, one in four Singaporeans do not get sufficient physical activity, which I think you all know is a leading risk factor for obesity. And in fact, obesity has been increasing in Singapore. Uh, about 12% 12, about 12 of our school children are obese, uh, up, from, uh, 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 up from about 10% in uh, 2012. 
So instead of simply exhorting our citizens to be healthy and, and, and do more exercise, the Health Promotion Board actually launched a National Steps Challenge. Uh, this is uh, 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 one of the posters that was being put up. Exercising is now made more attractive uh, by giving respondents uh, 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 a smart wearable technology in the form of a wearable uh, step tracker, as well as giving small incentives for uh, walking 5,000 to 10,000 steps daily. And uh, since launching in October, about 156,000 people have signed up, way beyond the expectations. In fact, so many people signed up that we ran out of wearable step trackers to give up, so we got to hold them back a little bit. But what's more important is the data that has been tracked has shown that on average, people who used to walk 3,000 to 4,000 steps daily has now almost doubled that to about 8,500. Third, how might we get self-employed persons to make contributions to their CPF MediSafe accounts to meet their future healthcare expenses? Now, today, the self-employed persons in Singapore constitute about 14% of our workforce. And this is set to grow due to the changing nature of work as well as the impact of technology. And despite outreach you know, through mailers and through roadshows, only about 80% of them regularly contribute to the MediSafe accounts. And their MediSafe uh, balance is actually about a quarter less than those who are employees. So it's an issue for us. So currently, the team is studying the data and actually conducting uh, interviews to better understand and profile the self-employed, which is actually quite a diverse group. So our hope is to be able to build an ecosystem and apply the behavioral insights that will facilitate voluntary contributions uh, automatically. So those were the three big projects that we're working on. So what did we learn? Uh, three quick lessons. First, as Owen has said, I think it's important for us to be deliberate, but also creative in terms of capability building. Owen talked a lot about uh, the need to recruit the right people, and I fully agree with that. Uh, in the MOM, we, the selection of the officers to form the few, the initial few that formed the behavioral design unit was quite critical. We selected officers who were highly passionate, who were very dogged, and also very connected in organizations. So we formed a team with, we think, quite a good mix of policy, operations, design, and behavioral sciences. And when we formed that, we invested in their development uh, quite aggressively, as well as give them the leadership support needed to do the projects. But really, to truly institutionalize BI in any organization, uh, you need more than this group of people, which I call the fire starters. We need to be able to set the organization ablaze, right, and get people to be excited with BI. But at the same time, you have to demystify it to make it more relatable and more applicable. So two years ago, to do that, we initiated a letter writing competition to transform the 1,000 over standard letters that the Ministry of Manpower issued to the citizens. Work teams, are, officers are encouraged to form uh, small teams you know, to apply the BI principles to change the tonality of the letters, and prizes were given you know, to the best design letters. So we did that two years ago. And then to build on that momentum, we have recently introduced the behavioral design platform. This is an in-house design, six months, a learn and applied curriculum, where selected officers will be able to work on actual business challenges sponsored by a head of department. And then to further ingrain the essence of human centricity into the DNA of our organization, uh, we have codified elements of behavioral insights into our new service excellence principles, which we call HEARTS, uh, which is a set of five service values that all MOM officers are expected to apply in their work. So for us, HEART, as you can see over there, stands for hear them out, uh, make it easy, anticipate their needs, respect every individual, and be timely. Second, I think it's important to seek to integrate BI with uh, other tools. Now, the application of BI does not need to be limited or done in isolation of other policy-making tools. The field of design thinking, for example, is very complementary with BI, as both disciplines start on the basis of being human-centered. In fact, our journey uh, on design thinking started way before behavioral insights. Uh, and at about the same time we set up the behavioral design unit, we have also set up a business analytics competency center to be able to learn and utilize advanced analytics uh, methodologies to solve business problems. So we have now integrated and are in the process of integrating the business analytics into our whole suite of policy making and sense making tools so that we can make better decisions that are human centered as well as data driven. Finally, don't be shy to share and learn from one another, including those experiments that did not work out. Uh, in the Singapore government, we have set up a behavioral design, uh, behavioral insights and design COP in 2014. Today, there are over 200 members from over 30 public agencies. And this community meets quarterly uh, to discuss project ideas and results, to share best practices in building up capabilities, as well as to explore partnership. And in fact, I'm not here alone today. There's uh, 14 other colleagues from nine public agencies that are with me today. 
And this sharing extends beyond Singapore you know, to, to, to other countries. So we are particularly pleased to be hosting uh, the BX edition of the uh, next edition of uh, BX in Singapore in 2017. And I certainly look forward to welcoming you all there. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to just quickly introduce uh, Elspeth. Um, Elspeth is one of the Behavioural Insight team's uh, original fire starters, in, in Ping Sin's uh, words. Um, she has done um, and laid the groundwork for a lot of the really interesting original studies that BIT did. She was involved in the work uh, that we did on job centres. She led a programme that I, think, I still think is like, one of the most interesting piece of work that we've done around social workers, how they take decisions, why they take different decisions on different days of the week at different times. Um, and then um, just before she came out to North America, uh, she was the founding director of a center that we created to look at adult skills uh, and knowledge. And now Elspeth is based in our New York office uh, where she heads a program across US cities. So I'll just hand over to Elspeth. Thank you. Um, this may be a mistake. I didn't realize I was gonna be attached. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Elspeth Kirkman. I run uh, our North American office. And it's pretty new, started out last August. We've uh, been trying to get our head down mostly has been our strategy and kind of get some, some good results. But I think the trajectory that Owen described absolutely applies, kind of knew it in theory and setting up a new office uh, was an interesting way of kind of living it in practice, I suppose. So I think there were kind of three key things that fall into this getting buy-in um, section that were really helpful for us uh, in the US. So the first is kind of, um, uh, the academic roots of a lot of this research are from, uh, are from the US, right? So academically, there's a huge kind of um, fantastic body of, uh, of literature, but also a lot of great researchers um, who, you know, are always kind of open to discuss, really keen to work with us. Uh, and we have some great partnerships uh, in that regard. And being that little bit closer has been extremely helpful. Um, backing from those really well respected in government. So... Uh, our foundational kind of contract with the North American office is with Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, some of you might have heard of Michael Bloomberg. He's quite a big deal and, uh, you know, is obviously incredibly well respected uh, as both, you know, someone in business, but also really critically as, as a very kind of effective, uh, uh, an effective politician, an effective uh, government leader. So that's been kind of, you know, extremely helpful to be able to kind of plug into a uh, you know, a network of um, organisations that are already kind of uh, have cut their teeth and are very well respected in this uh, in this area. Um, and then finally, a really strong kind of precedent for applied projects. So starting out in North America, we weren't starting out, you know, with a kind of blank slate in the same way that we were uh, in British government, perhaps. Um, there's a lot of organisations here that uh, have already kind of laid a lot of the foundation work. The president, um, you know, kind of came out and endorsed behavioral science and experimentation, and, uh, you know, we're kind of standing on the shoulders of, uh, of lots of great work already. So I think for me, that's been, uh, you know, a great experience in the North American office to kind of uh, be able to take advantage of those things uh, and actually make stuff happen. So um, thinking about what, what I mean by making stuff happen. So we signed up to uh, basically completing... Uh, 18 randomized control trials in about nine months, uh, well, about 12 months, with um, city government across the US. So we've been working with uh, eight cities now, actually. Um, we've actually done, uh, I was, I've been walking around telling people it was 21 randomized control trials, but apparently we've actually done 24, so apparently I can't count, which is a worrying, <laughs> a worrying kind of basic qualification, I think. Uh, and to pick these projects, you know, it's not it's pretty ambitious and it's not, it's not normal, I don't think, to uh, have to try and kind of crank out this many projects. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to say, actually, you know, what we're doing is trying as quickly as we can to prove that, you know, yes, this stuff works in the UK. Yes, it's worked for us elsewhere. Yes, it's working at the federal level, um, you know, and, and lots of other people are kind of making inroads at state level and at city level with perhaps bigger cities. But when we're working with kind of mid-sized cities with populations uh, of a million people or, or less, then, um, you know, can we kind of get these things to work? So we're having to do that thing where we're picking the quick wins. And I use this kind of framework to um, think about what a good project might look like. So 
On the one axis, you've got how easy is it to do. Um, this is highly scientific. Uh, you'll see from the fact it has no numbers on it whatsoever. Uh, how easy is it to do? So, uh, you know, do we have to invest a lot of time? Do we have to invest a lot of money? The effort? Are you burning political capital doing it? You know, is it kind of uh, an infrastructure change? Whatever. And then the second thing is, uh, if it was successful, how impactful would it be? So this is kind of thinking about both your effect size, but also, you know, from a sort of policy perspective, you might have a, a huge effect, but does it actually kind of move the needle on something? And uh, the way I kind of characterized the four quadrants is, um, uh, was described, I was, I was showing this to an academic collaborator of ours, and he said uh, that it's just the right amount of whimsy, uh, which I think is going to be the title of my obituary when, uh, <laughs> when I die. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek uh, reference, I guess, to that old uh, Boston Consulting Group model of uh, cash cows and dogs. So we have um, dead donkeys, which are very hard to do and zero impact. So there's absolutely no point in you, um, uh, you know, trying to take on one of these projects, avoid them like the plague. Uh, then we have mules. So mules are kind of, uh, they're everywhere. They're quite common. They're good, uh, you know, they get work done. Um, but they're not going to kind of change the world anytime soon. Uh, we've got horses, so hard work, good work. Um, <laughs> this is a bit sanctioned framework, but <laughs> it's my way of thinking about things. And then we have our, uh, our dream projects. We have the unicorns. Um, uh, and unicorns, to be honest, usually turn out to be a horse with an ice cream cone on its head, which is you know, worse than an actual horse. So uh, if you think you found a unicorn, you probably haven't. Uh, so we kind of think about our projects in this way, and I think it's just a ni nice kind of neat way of uh, summarizing, uh, summarizing how to pick a project. So some of our early projects I'll just talk about now, and I'll kind of overlay on this. So we've done a bunch of stuff around revenue collection. So, you know, Owen already talked about the kind of classic 9 out of 10 people pay their tax trial. Uh, we've done some stuff uh, in the US that's drawn on many of the insights that we've used in the UK, that we've used in Australia. Uh, that we've done in collaboration with our partners uh, in the Ministry of Manpower in Singapore and various other organisations. Um, and some of the results have been really good so far. So we just did a, um, uh, a couple of sewer billing trials with cities, for example, that brought forward about half a million dollars uh, in payments, doing some cool things like handwriting on the envelope, um, uh, led by my colleague Owen. Confusingly, we all have the same names. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's been a really kind of good quick win. We've also more than doubled collection rates on parking fines, and people often ask about the kind of cross-cultural translation on this work. Uh, it's definitely true that in the UK, in the US, and apparently in Singapore, everyone gets a parking ticket, immediately decides they want to appeal and doesn't want to pay it. So, uh, we, are all, uh, we are all one in that regard. Uh, so, you get some good stuff on revenue collection, and I've kind of put this in the, you know, pretty impactful pretty easy to do category. It is a bit of a dream area, you know, and it obviously depends what you're spending the revenue on, but money for government's never going to be uh, a bad thing and pot potentially can generate great impact. Um, next up, we've got demand shift stuff. So, you know, this is more about helping governments to channel the demand so that they can use their limited resources to best effect uh, and they can kind of target, uh, uh, target help and assistance towards those that really need it. So David, uh, in the initial session this morning, talked about some of the work we've been doing to shift people uh, out of the DMV and to go online. Um, no one wants to go to the DMV, no one likes it, but people still end up kind of doing it. And we just had this really successful trial which uh, in the city of Denver where uh, the result is that we're going to get about 9,000 drivers uh, in the next year to renew their license plates online. Uh, and one thing I thought was really interesting about this is I presented it a while ago and uh, someone came up to me and said, oh, you know why I always go to the DMV to renew? And I was like, oh, no, why? And she was like, because I just always take a really bad photograph and I get, like, one chance to have my photo retaken <laughs> in the DMV. So I was like, okay, maybe we should think about online, uh, online photographs as our next, uh, our next nudge. Uh, and we also got um, businesses to basically up their use of online tax filing by uh, about two-thirds. So, um, uh, yeah, big filing period in January, uh, and we sent... a various different letters to businesses uh, kind of emphasizing the benefits or emphasizing the losses of not filing their, their taxes online and we found interestingly that the social norms message that told them that most other businesses in Denver were actually filing online was really effective so again something that works uh, internationally uh, and then lastly um, workforce development stuff so basically helping governments to get in new staff, uh, to get in more people, to get in a sufficient number of applicants, but also a more diverse range of applicants so that they can be more kind of representative 
uh, of the populations they're seeking to serve. Uh, so we're in the middle of a piece of work at the moment with the city of San Jose, where we're looking at getting uh, about uh, uh, a bunch of police a, a bunch of police candidates to basically reactivate their application. So they've gone through the process. It doesn't seem that they're ineligible uh, necessarily. They've just kind of dropped out, uh, and it's just kind of a prompting to get to get them to uh, to re-engage. Um, and about one in six people seem to be re-engaging, uh, looking at the interim cut of the data. Um, We've also been using postcard ads to um, basically cold approach people in the city of Chattanooga to say, hey, would you like to become a police officer? So we have um, a data set that is, uh, you know, people who are on the election register. So it looks like they're fairly kind of civically engaged individuals. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth Linos was talking about this uh, in, in one of her sessions, I believe. But um, we found that certain messages on these postcard ads are more uh, effective, particularly ones that emphasize uh, the idea of something being a challenge over the idea of something being, uh, you know, intrinsically kind of or, you know, inherently good, I suppose, uh, for the world, which is kind of an interesting public service, uh, flipping of the public service uh, message or received wisdom. But actually, uh, for particular groups of candidates, so there's a differential effect on African-American applicants, for example, where we emphasise um, the kind of stability uh, uh, of, of uh, policing as a career as well. So, you know, really interesting in terms of uh, diversity. So there's some early results. I'll talk about one more. Um, and this is kind of, uh, the percentages you'll notice are really low, but bear in mind when I'm talking about this that uh, this is essentially a kind of social marketing campaign. So we worked with a not-for-profit and the city of New Orleans health department. And uh, we basically sent text messages out to offer people who were living in uh, severe poverty uh, the option of going to a free doctor's appointment. And the qualifying criteria were um, severe poverty, but also not having visited a doctor for the last two years. So we know that um, it's not a group of people who are routinely engaging in, uh, uh, in healthcare appointments. And we sent a simple message that uh, this is the response rate, so the number of people replying and saying, yes, I'll take up this free appointment. 1% response rate to a simple message that just said, uh, uh, do you want to take up this free doctor's appointment? So it's a pretty low baseline. Uh, we tried this ego message. Uh, where we basically said, you've been specially selected, and we've seen that this has worked really well in other settings, uh, albeit with kind of very different groups. So we've done it on uh, businesses, getting them to take up a government subsidy, for example. And we found that uh, significantly different from the simple message, telling people they've been specially selected, uh, goes up to 1.4%. And then we found that um, we tested this pro-social message. So again, this is the idea that we should appeal to people on the basis of uh, some sort of pro-social motivation. So we said... Um, visit the doctor so that you can look after the ones that you love. Uh, and this idea, everybody, we, you know, we kind of always put our, uh, put our bets on which one we think is going to be best in advance. And unsurprisingly, I think a lot of people's intuition was that this idea would work the most effectively. And we actually found it was significantly worse than uh, just sending the simple informational, informational message. And that's something that we're kind of finding uh, again and again, actually, in lots of different settings. So it's starting to become an interesting trend. The other thing about this that I quite like is that... Um, we went back and we took that best performing message, the ego message, and we used it as our new control the next time around. So we basically had uh, a whole bunch of people who still hadn't responded, sending the messages again. We, sent, uh, uh, we stratified on what they'd received the last time, and we sent half of them a, uh, you've been specially selected uh, for a, or you've been selected for a free appointment text, which was uh, the best one from last time. And we sent half of them a, we saved you a free appointment worth $150 text. And the reason that we thought this was going to work is that in the UK, a uh, very different setting, but we actually looked at getting um, people to show up for appointments where people were missing appointments. And the kind of most, uh, the most effective message was letting people know the value of the appointment. But we found that in the US, that didn't work. That's actually really bad compared to the, uh, you know, compared to the old control. And I suspect it's just one of those interesting kind of... Um, differences between healthcare systems. I think in the UK, people don't think, uh, because we've got nationalised health insurance, people don't think uh, of health in, in terms of monetary value. Whereas in the US, it's not a surprise to anybody to know that um, you know, a health appointment is actually worth something. Uh, and similarly in Australia, the, the cost focus message uh, did actually work and was effective. Um, okay, so now we're kind of trying to move into some new policy areas. So. Um, uh, we've got a bunch of kind of live questions that we're working on at the moment with um, various clients. So, you know, can we improve health in the criminal justice process? Can we reduce violence against children in refugee camps? Can we uh, 
share information better to boost clinical outcomes for patients? Can we ensure that people remain happy and healthy in old age? Uh, we're working on all of these. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the hepatitis work that we're doing because I think it's really interesting. It's one of these areas where much of the gap between um, hepatitis infection being eliminated and where we're currently at is actually down to behaviours. So, um, you know, a lot of the medication is already there, particularly for hepatitis C and for hepatitis B, there's a, uh, B, there's a, a vaccination. So this is kind of a little bit uh, of an overwhelming slide, I think. But if we've got this big goal, which is to decrease morbidity and mortality from hep B and hep C infection, then what we're trying to do at the moment is to break that down into the sort of, I suppose it's kind of a theory of change, where it's just saying if all of these things happened, then we would be able to reach that big goal. Now, how do we kind of incorporate uh, uh, behavioral insights and how do we kind of tweak all those small levels to add up to overall success? So we have a bunch of different actors at play, right? So we have our orange boxes, which are the infected population. So they've got to take preventative action, they've got to get tested, and they've got to get treated if they're actually infected. And underneath those, we have what we're thinking about as kind of micro behaviors. So trying to just get it down to that lowest level of, you know, what's the, what's the kind of opportunity to intervene? What's the, uh, the sort of touch point? Uh, who's kind of acting and doing what? Uh, then we have health providers. So they have to take a bunch of actions like uh, administering the proper diagnostic testing protocol, um, practicing infection control in health settings. We have non-clinical professionals. So these people range from kind of community advocacy groups all the way through to tattoo parlors and various other places that uh, might be trans transmission risk sites. And then we have the people who actually work on this particular initiative. So we're looking at internal behavior change within their organization. And uh, lastly, everybody else in the kind of policy space who you know, has some kind of ability to be able to, um, I guess, make uh, the access, uh, the access to healthcare commensurate to the burden of this particular disease. So we're looking at that, we're working on that, and hopefully, uh, you know, this time next year in 2017, I'll be able to tell you about that time we cured hepatitis. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, this is kind of what we're doing where we're trying to say, build our capability and support others to do the same. So we have this big target in the middle, which is just let's be better than we were yesterday. Uh, I'm actually not being good at this particular moment because my time is up. Uh, but I'll kind of talk through this. I think we have some time for questions, so my apologies for eating into it. Uh, so we have kind of four factors to this. So there's humility, empiricism, and partnership. And for me, there's kind of three questions that we can ask ourselves to, uh, and that we do routinely ask ourselves to think about that. So one is, you know, if my government counterparts uh, say to themselves, what happens if I don't bother showing up for work? It's like, you know, a child's life could be at risk or, you know, someone might die or actually, you know, this really important process isn't going to get done. Um, if I don't bother showing up to work, I kind of need to, you know, to make sure that I, as my answer is never going to be as compelling as that. Um, but what is it? Is it, you know, is there a good reason for us to kind of be getting out of bed? And if there isn't, then what can we do and how can we do it better to change that? Um, what do we not know that our partners do know? Um, the limits of our knowledge are certainly not the limits of knowledge. Uh, and basically every single project we go into, we go into with a particular skill set and a particular kind of uh, focus, uh, but we're really reliant on kind of fitting, you know, the jigsaw together with uh, all the things that our partners are experts in. Uh, and what do we know that our partners don't? Because um, sometimes, there, you know, there are things and we can kind of, uh, you know, we can be helpful and that's basically what we're there for. So just trying to understand that so we can be as efficient as possible. Um, if we think about building our partner's capacity, there's three things we've been doing. So we've built a uh, digital toolkit, which is in its sort of beta testing phase at the moment, which is basically uh, how to run um, a randomized control trial step by step um, in a policy setting. Uh, we've been running lots of workshops and we've been kind of coaching partners that we're working with using this three project model where we run the first project in partnership with them. Um, we jointly run the second project and then the third project we kind of, you know, uh, Take the take the stabilizing wheels off the bike and watch them watch them fly and then maybe kind of uh, you know go and uh, pick them up and wipe some bloody knees if necessary. Um, test learn adapt. So we're trying to build in kind of quicker ways of doing this. So one thing that we've been doing is more uh, laboratory based or online kind of concept testing experiments. So if we could spend four weeks doing a literature review or we could do you know a mechanical Turk study. Uh, much faster than that, then let's, you know, really kind of refine our hypothesis before we get into that, lit uh, that literature um, and kind of think about how we might do things better and, uh, you know, flip some of our assumptions on their head. And then we also have this methodology internally called Think Groups, which is about um, 
I won't kind of go into detail. If anyone's interested, you can ask, but it's a good way to kind of uh, eliminate groupthink, uh, essentially. And then understanding the context. This is like, you know, if we don't do this, then we're never getting work again. So we immerse ourselves in the field, we seek feedback, and we kind of relentlessly try and find the energy to act on, uh, to act on that feedback, which is always difficult, but always rewarding. Um, so I think this is you, Owen. Where next? Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, maybe a second. Um, so I'm going to quickly just tee up. I've got I've got a mic. Um, I'm going to quickly tee up a few areas that we thought it would be worth uh, discussing. But we're basically in a sort of Q and A uh, session now. And given that we are we started a little bit late and we're running a little bit over, so maybe we'll finish on time and uh, we can have a conversation uh, afterwards in the break. Um, so we just thought there were a few sort of themes that uh, would be worthy of, of further discussion. One of them is about mainstreaming behavioral science, something that's come through for all of the sessions, I think, at, at BX this year. Um, the other is something that um, I think Ping Soon was particularly um, highlighting in his uh, talk, which is about the links between behavioral insights and, and other fields, so design and, uh, and data science. New areas, like the stuff that... BOT in the UK has started to think about around uh, character skills where we're starting to get some of our uh, early results. And then the last thing which I think is really interesting is around whether we can start a program of international trials collaboration. So one thing that we would love to be able to do is to start running trials across different countries looking at the same questions at the same time. So if anyone wants to start those conversations then either ask a question about it or come and see me afterwards. Um, but um, do we have any, any questions for um, any members of the, uh, of the panel? Yeah. Um, I've got a question which is specific to the UK context, but maybe the Singapore experience speaks to it as well. Yeah. In the, uh, inside the Nudge Unit book, there's quite an emphasis put on communication, but at one point it said that, of course, there's much more to it than communication. But I'd be interested in the collaboration you've developed in the UK government with the government communication service because they weren't on your list of uh, partner groups but they must have been an important collaborator yeah. I think. Yeah. And the question is how to uh, how to build on that collaboration with communication groups because a lot of what you talk about does involve communication yeah. so I wonder when you look about links with other fields Right. What about communication as well as yeah. another field? Are you, are you uh, in communications yourself? Or? Yeah. yeah. So I think um, my, my personal take on this is that in the UK government context, um, communications experts have tended to see their roles or been forced to see their roles as the people who, after a policy has been designed and crafted and needs to be announced, do all of the stuff that involves getting the message out there. Yeah, which they're trying to change. Which they're trying to change. And, um, and I think that actually a lot of the work that we've been doing can be really helpful in that context to basically just say that if you are a communicator in a government context, your aim should be behavioral change as much as holding the press at, at bay. And I think if you start to reframe communication in that way, then you start to generate much more interesting opportunities for people in the field to think about what their roles are. So we do regularly have those kind of conversations. I don't think we're 100% you know, of the way there, but we're certainly moving down that, down that path. Yeah, they, they've gone in that direction in the UK. The Government yeah. Communication Service says that they see their roles communicating to bring about behavior. Yeah, yeah. and in okay. fact, they've just produced a paper recently that explicitly draws on our East framework to think about how they might do communications differently in the in the future. Yeah, I wonder if the Singapore experience fits with that. Yeah. I think absolutely. I think the communications part of the Singapore government. Uh, I mean, the problem with marketing, as we all know, is that I know that fifty percent of the budget is being wasted. I just don't know which half, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so I think uh, one of the units uh, that we have in the, our Ministry of Communications and Information is indeed looking at that. But I suppose the challenge for, for many of the communications experts is that they intuitively understand some of these behavioural insights. But it's very difficult to try to measure some of the outcome as a result of that. Of course, you can measure in terms of changes in perception and all that, but those are not really hard numbers that you can work on. But they intuitively get it and they're trying to apply some of these behavioural insights into it. But measuring it and running RCT out of some of these campaigns are not something that we look at. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just see that as an area for future attention, but that's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think it's an important one. Any other any other questions? Yeah. Um, what efforts have you taken or maybe have planned for disseminating all uh, what you've learned about what works and what doesn't across uh, behavioral insights teams or across the world? Uh, so internationally as well as as domestically, or well, so you know we're. Uh, there's many people now yeah. um, in the business of trying to, to uh, prompt behavior change in, in governments. Um, is there anything that's being done to try to um, communicate to those other yeah. groups with similar objectives? What has worked? What hasn't worked? Yeah, so we, um, in the UK, we try to be as open and transparent as we can within the confines of our government work. Most of the time that means publishing the findings uh, for the trials or the policy work that we uh, undertake. So I am at the moment pulling together an annual update, uh, which will cover the whole of the UK team's work, the whole of the North American team's work, uh, work in Australia, some of our work in Singapore as well. Uh, as well as that, um, there's been a big push within the UK uh, government that we've helped to support around creating uh, so-called what works institutions that collate the evidence in different policy areas and then disseminate their findings. And there are some really amazing exemplars in this area. Um, top of the list is probably the Education Endowment Foundation, which ranks all education uh, findings by the quality of the research. So whether there are tens of RCTs in that area um, or the evidence is, is uh, less robust and the effectiveness of the interventions as well. One of the, yeah, one of the things I would add um, on that is that, uh, so, you know, we're, we're really into sharing our information. Anybody else who wants to kind of collate examples will always kind of uh, provide them in whatever format and those kinds of things. But one of the things we've been thinking sort of fairly seriously about as we're building uh, this body of research uh, under the, the initiative that we're working on is, you know, we're behavioural scientists, so we know that just giving people the information isn't sufficient to get it to stick and to get people to act on it. So actually... I would love to see uh, more in the way of not just bringing things together, but actually experimenting around, you know, what are the ways that you can get kind of, um, uh, you can get people to buy in, particularly in relation to problems like, uh, you know, the kind of people who digest and use research, uh, that sort of by definition going to be smart, curious people. Um, and smart, curious people like to kind of invent their own kind of way of doing things because it gives them purpose and makes them excited. So are there sort of things we can do to, uh, you know, give everybody all the information they need, but they just have to arrange it in the right order to kind of, uh, you know, to kind of get there or something like that. Um, uh, and also allow for people to, um, you know, build on and contribute to an existing knowledge base rather than just consume it. Because, uh, you know, particularly in a world where one of the criticisms of nudging or sort of smaller interventions is, well, everybody's going to become inured to it, then um, it would be really great to kind of see an evolving and quality assured uh, research database, I suppose. No, I think I'm all for sharing it. I think we just need somebody to come forward to take the lead. A lot of times, you know, many of the things that we are doing are quite similar across many jurisdictions. As you can see from the sharing, uh, it does can cross cultural. I do know of an effort in OECD that's trying to compile some of these. And I think for the Singapore side, we've contributed our case studies. So they've created a certain template. You know, so we're just populating it. And um, I'm, I'm just not very familiar with where's the status of that effort. Somebody from OECD is pulling that together and we're contributing to that. And hopefully that body of knowledge will grow and they will be able to create an international community of practice. We'll have to grab Faisal, who's in a Faisal, parallel session right. at the moment right. uh, in the break. Um, Renos, do you want to...? Sure. So actually, Faisal is next door talking about your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with some early insights of what he's pulling together or experiences. Yeah. So okay. I, I work at the World Bank, and, and so you can sign us up on the international trials. Excellent. Uh, but so I had a couple of questions about, so most times a lot of our projects deal with kind of more complex issues, partly because, you know, com you know uh, sophistication of, you know, digital access that mean data is not as accessible to some of the countries we work, uh, not all of the cases, but, um, but I guess I had two, two related questions. One is, since you're you know, the most advanced in terms of years, projects, trials. One question is about the sustainability of the effects and what are you learning from, you know, replicating, scaling up a lot of the, you know, the things that have worked and, and do you need to adjust as you, you know, readdress some of the same issues? 
or, or how is that evolution? And, and I guess a related one is you're moving to the more complex you know, areas where more diagnostics need to be a bit more kind of carefully adapted, et cetera. Is that changing uh, the diagnostics kind of a approach? I guess, and, and, and in terms of you can speak to the, you know, time length or depth or, you know, whatever you're changing in, in terms of how to, to go about it. Okay. All right. Shall I do sustainability and then yeah. you can do diagnostics? Um, so I think the, this question of um, how sustainable are the effects comes up time and again. I think it's actually really quite an important one. Um, I think what we, what we have been finding is that um, in some areas like tax compliance, um, uh, the same interventions uh, in the same context the following year do have similar effects, but they're not on the same person. Um, so if you were to bombard an individual with the same message, nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time, you are likely to see uh, diminishing effects over, over time. In other areas, like um, I can see Michael Sanders at the back, um, has done a lot of work on charitable giving that David spoke about uh, this morning. And Michael uh, found, found in some of his experiments that the same interventions don't have uh, as strong an effect the following year to those same individuals, but those individuals can be used, as David explained um, earlier, as your, uh, uh, as your next round of people who can encourage others to engage in the, in the program. So it's partly about thinking about how you can evolve your strategies over time. But one important thing to note, I think, is that that is just in relation to those situations in which you have kind of ongoing processes where you need somebody to engage and then re-engage. There are lots of programs that don't require that. Um, automatically enrolling somebody into a into a pension plan, or alternatively, some of the work that we've been doing, like the stuff I mentioned on job centres, where it's really about changing what might be considered to be more habitual behaviours rather than the one-off decisions that you're asking somebody to do repeatedly. Um, Ping Sin, do you want to talk about either of those? Uh, uh, questions? I'll just add a comment that that. Um Certainly, many of these interventions that we do currently are really based on pretty simple kind of intervention, which is changing the letter. I mean, I mentioned an example of how with a change in the letter, we increase the take-up of that one-on-one to 32%, right? But actually, are we happy with 32%? Probably not. So actually, you know, after you do something, I think we went to look at the data. Why is it that still only two? We thought that's the best letter you've ever imagined, right? So the team was actually keen to redo another letter and change. We said, probably not. Let's not just try another letter. Let's try to understand why they are not coming. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we found that they are not taking out the service because the hours that in which we are giving them to come are actually not right. So the right intervention is not to send another letter, but actually change the process so that we offer more booking slots at more convenient locations. But of course, to do that, we need to structurally change some of our backend processes. So I mean, the point here is that you know, I think a lot of time uh, when we do behavioral insights, we tend to just go for the easy stuff, so to speak, just changing the letter. But there's only a limit in which you can achieve the outcome through changing the letter. Mm -hmm. Some of the backend changes, you may have to look at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the kind of, I'll take the, the, the second one first, but on the different and uh, more diagnostic uh, work, I think one of the great advantages that I've seen um, from the Behavioural Insights team having grown so much is that it's allowed us to really diversify uh, the types of researchers and the types of research skills that we're bringing in. So we now have many more people who have very strong uh, kind of ethnographic research backgrounds or qual backgrounds uh, or, you know, other things that maybe potentially, you know, we're, like we're less well trained and less well known for um, originally. And then one thing I was going to say on the uh, one thing we're grappling with at the moment on the kind of uh, sustaining effects point is um, when you have a big problem like how do you reduce violence against children and it's essentially a case of how do you change a social norm um, you know, away from something that is quite prevalent, then the problem that you're trying to solve today to kind of solve a little bit of that problem, um, you know, your best case scenario is that you're successful with that and then tomorrow's problem is a different one and you're not kind of trying to solve the whole thing in one go. So how do you make sure that... Uh, you're building not just a one-off kind of intervention, but uh, interventions and messaging and, uh, you know, kind of um, substitute behaviours, whatever it might be, that actually evolve over time so that you're able to kind of make more and more progress and not just stop when you get that kind of small change, which frankly, you know, when you're talking about uh, inverting a norm isn't going to be particularly powerful. So, um, yeah, we're kind of working on something to do with that at the moment. So we've just got a couple of minutes uh, left. There are two more questions from practitioners. So maybe we'll take them both together. Paul, do you want to ask yours and then? So, so my question was really, you focused on sort of end user 
behavior change at the moment? How much work are you involved in or thinking about in terms of organizational behavior, influencing people within those organizations to do things differently? Uh, would you like to ask your question as well? Yeah, I, I think it was more about the, the multidiscipline right. side of things. Um, P and I've been talking about the issue around advanced analytics, but also understanding <coughs> the motivation you need to do for your staff that might be on call centres or do the engagement. And the third end was you need to have a subsequent con uh, a uh, consequence of not replying. So you might send your first letter or your nudge email. But if you do nothing after that, you don't actually take anyone ultimately to court for not doing something. They then over time become ineffective. So it's that that sort of the nudge is simple, but what's the policy environment that you're actually trying to solve? And then what are the multidiscipline tools you use? Do you want to say that one? Um, so I, I, I'll just take I'll take the organisational behaviour um, uh, question first, which is I think it's a, another really important area that we've. We have explored for the past few years, but not as intensely as I think we will in the future. Um, uh, a few people have mentioned over the past couple of days, including Iris in her opening talk about the work that we've been doing about uh, recruitment processes. Mm -hmm. And there we're explicitly building tools and uh, services that enable organizations to take decisions in different ways without having to spend weeks and weeks digesting the latest behavioral science uh, uh, literature. So I think there's huge potential for us to be talking maybe in a year's time about new platforms that draw on behavioral science to, to do things differently. Um, the multidisciplinary side of things, I, I actually think the Singaporeans are taking this to a level that we haven't done in the UK <laughs> yet. Um, but that combination of data analytics, um, uh, design thinking, behavioral insights, I mean, there is a nexus of different disciplines there that all can be combined to do, I think, really interesting, important work in the future. I'll give a quick example, because since the time is up, right, how we are trying to bring it together, right? So the challenge here is, of course, how can we be more effective in conducting uh, uh, inspections, right? So what we do, of course, is to, first of all, use business analytics to develop a predictive model of which are the companies that are likely to, be, to have d dangerous practices. So we use that and we use a predictive model to because there's only so much inspection resources that we have. So we use data analytics, crunch the data, develop a model and say, look, these are the 100 places that is likely to default or do something wrong. That's where we then send our inspectors. Now, when we send our inspectors there, can the actions that they do be done from a behavioral insights nudges? Of course. So then we will, we will study what sort of uh, actions that they're taking and try to use behavioral insights so that it is not the enforcement oriented but more solution oriented. So that's one example of how we're trying to bring the two disciplines together. Just a quick. Great, well, we're, we're out of time, but if people have more questions, then come and talk to us now. Thank you.